Hello, my name is Wendy Stringer and I'm the Domestic Abuse Coordinator for Rochdale Borough Council. The following slides have been produced for professionals and those working or volunteering with families during the coronavirus. The intention is to give some information and support around domestic abuse and the impact that COVID-19 may be having on families affected by domestic abuse during this time. During the pandemic of coronavirus, Rochdale Borough Council are working with other public sector organisations, including the local NHS services, Link for Life, Rochdale Borough Wide Housing, the voluntary sector and the police to ensure that all possible actions to help safeguard people are being taken locally. Information on our services and support for children, young people, families, older people and businesses can be found here at rochdale.gov.uk slash coronavirus. These slides have been produced for family support staff and other professionals or volunteers or anyone that is coming into contact with families during this difficult time. The aim is so that people would know how to recognise domestic abuse and what to do if they had a concern or if a family disclosed domestic abuse to them. It's so that people are aware of what local and national support agencies are available and also to highlight that safeguarding is everybody's responsibility and what we need to do if we have concern that a child or children are at risk. The government has produced some guidance for domestic abuse during COVID-19. At the end of this video, there are some web links and one of them will take you directly to this guidance. Much of this slide covers the guidance given by the government. One of the main things that is included within their guidance is clarification of the isolation rules for people affected by domestic abuse. It clarifies that people can breach the rules if they are escaping domestic abuse. Also, there are details of where to get help over child contact, welfare benefits, etc. In addition to the guidance, the government are also going to be launching a public awareness campaign, hashtag you are not alone. This campaign is to show solidarity, to inform victims that services are still available at this time. And part of the campaign were for people to draw a red heart on the palm of their hand to show that domestic abuse is unacceptable in any circumstances. The campaign will also include the promotion of the 24-hour Domestic Abuse National Helpline and there will be posters in supermarkets and local charities. In addition to this, the government will be investing more into local domestic abuse charities at this time to help them continue and to increase their provision. Safeguarding means protecting the most vulnerable children and adults from abuse and neglect. During the COVID-19 pandemic, professionals and volunteers may come into contact with individuals and families they haven't met before. If you see something, are told something, or something doesn't feel right and you are concerned for someone's safety, you need to report it. Don't ignore it. It's also vital to let our families know that Rochdale support services are still available for them during this difficult time. Here are some useful contacts if you have a concern about a child or family that may be affected by domestic abuse. If you have safeguarding concerns about a child or children, you can contact our Complex Early Help and Safeguarding Hub, also known as eHash, on the numbers listed here. We have an out of hours number so you can ring at any time of day. There is also an email address that you can email any concerns or queries into. If a person or people are at immediate risk, please ring the police on 999. If a person is calling from a mobile handset and they cannot speak for any reason, they can press 55. This will indicate to the operator that they need police assistance. This is called silent solutions. For non-urgent calls to the police, please ring 101. If you visit our Rochdale Domestic Abuse web pages, there is different information on there about local services available for victims, perpetrators and children. Also resources are on there for professionals as well. What is domestic abuse? This is the government definition of domestic abuse. Any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sexual orientation. The abuse can encompass but is not limited to psychological, physical, sexual, economic and emotional forms of abuse. 
What is coercive control? Coercive behaviour is an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threat, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten a victim. Controlling behaviour is a range of acts designed to make a person subordinate and or dependent by isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the means needed for independence, resistance and escape and regulating their everyday behaviour. It's been a criminal offence since 2015 and some examples of it are a person repeatedly putting their partner down, calling them names or telling them that they're worthless, threatening to kill them or to kill their children, threatening to publish information about them or to report them to the police or to the local authorities, damaging property or household goods, forcing a person to take part in criminal activity or child abuse, controlling how much money a person has and how they spend it and isolating them from friends and family, monitoring their activities and their every movement. These are examples of coercive and controlling behaviour. Domestic abuse can include the following. Physical abuse, kicking, punching, slapping, pulling hair, throwing objects and strangulation. Sexual abuse, including rape, sexual assault, being made to watch pornographic films or being made to sleep with other people. Financial abuse, such as controlling all the money, gambling family assets, using someone's name for debt or to access credit. Coercive and controlling behaviour, as discussed in the previous slide. Digital online abuse. This can be monitoring of social media profiles or emails, or it can be abuse on social media platforms, such as sharing intimate photos or videos without a person's consent. Honour-based abuse and violence can include extended members of the family, using the family name or honour and culture to abuse a person. Forced marriage is when parents or family members or other peoples in the victim's community coerce a boy, girl, woman or man in, to enter into a marriage against their will. Female genital mutilation, which is the cutting of female genitals. And adolescence to parent violence, also known as AVPA. There are some separate training slides on this that have been produced by our early help team. Domestic abuse and who may be at risk. In short, anyone may be at risk of domestic abuse. The more obvious signs may be physical, such as bruises, cuts, loss of hair or broken bones. Emotional signs can be depression, a person may be withdrawn in low mood, be quiet or jumpy and nervous or have low self-esteem. Their behaviour may include missed appointments with yourself or other professionals. Their partner may always be there. They may act ashamed or reluctant to speak or avoid eye contact. You may also notice an increase in their drug or alcohol use. In terms of home visits, these will be rare during COVID-19, but when we are visiting people in their homes, we need to notice things such as damaged property or broken items within the home. Antisocial behaviour and neighbour nuisance is something that's reported within our neighbourhoods and again we need to consider the cause of this and unpick what may be happening in a person's home. Information sharing with other agencies is important so that we can gain more insight and a holistic picture into what is occurring for possible victims of domestic abuse. The impact of domestic abuse on children can be devastating and long lasting. There's an increased risk of physical and emotional abuse to children. There are risks to the unborn child, including low birth rate and miscarriage. There's also delayed development, including brain development, physical development, language development. This can include sleep disturbance, which can affect their ability to concentrate and learn. The long-term psychological harm can include hypervigilance, anxiety, negative mood and depression, or poor attachment and separation anxiety. And they may have limited capacity to escape the domestic abuse or manage the domestic abuse, and this can affect children emotionally. Some children will become a carer for their parents or siblings and this may make them feel resentful or isolated and stigmatised. The risk of psychological harm is high for those who also experience other forms of abuse and neglect.
Some children may have anger and aggression issues and this may result in them having trouble making friends, having angry outbursts or feeling fearful and have anxiety and worry a lot of the time. There are many barriers for a victim seeking support regarding domestic abuse. One of these barriers is fear. Fear of what the abuser may do to them. Fear of what the abuser may do to their friends or family or children if they try to leave or access support. Another thing is cultural beliefs. They may be have been abused by somebody that says that forms of abuse are justified due to the religion or culture that they are in. Language barriers limited access to support within the community or immigration and visa issues, no recourse to public funds. For the LGBT community, it could be a fear of being outed and a lack of specialist services or a fear of homophobia within generic provision. Older victims, there may be that generational acceptance of abuse, that this is just how it is and you just shut up and put up. A fear of starting over later in life shame or that provision is aimed at younger people or they could have ill health and care needs that makes them more dependent on their abuser. Male victims may fear that they won't be believed and again we've got limited specialist provision for male victims including a lack of refuge spaces nationally. Finances can be a big barrier for people leaving if they're financially dependent on their abuser or they do not know that they can make claims within their own name or are entitled to houses and mortgages or any financial assets they may have with their partner. Risk is one of the most important things we need to consider when working with families affected by domestic abuse. Increased risk at separation is something that we need to be aware of as practitioners. The risk of harm and homicide increases at the time of separation. Leaving a relationship doesn't mean that the abuse stops. In fact, sometimes it can escalate and get worse at this time. That's why it's very important if somebody is planning to leave a relationship, they do it as safely as possible and if possible with the support of a specialist domestic abuse agency. Victims may have had a DASH risk assessment completed with them. This is a tool that is used by the police nationally and also by domestic abuse agencies. Any practitioner can use this tool and it is to assess the risk to the victim. It gives them a score of standard, medium or high risk and all high risk cases are referred into our MARAC. We are going to be running regular online training sessions about the DASH risk assessment during the COVID-19 pandemic. You should receive an email about this. If you haven't, please contact me directly on my email and I will ensure that you get details of how to access this short online training. What we need to consider is risk to the victim and their perception of it. Also, risk to any children involved in the family and to remember our safeguarding duties and to report any concerns we have to eHash on the numbers or email in previous slides. Also, when working with families, we need to consider the risk to ourselves. In terms of risk to the victim, have the conversation in a safe and private place or a private way. In times of self-isolation, it may be difficult to get opportunities to speak with people about concerns. Be aware of this risk. Don't do it in front of the abuser. And if you are having to have a conversation on the phone, consider that the abuser is likely to be present. Check if it is safe to speak. If you have concerns and you can't see any safe opportunity to speak with the person safely, raise this with your line manager to discuss or find ways to make contact safely. Get professional support for safety planning and leaving safely for those families. Contact our rehash or as always, if there's an immediate risk, ring the police on 999. Again, thinking about the risk to the person, to yourself or to any children, remembering that safeguarding is everybody's duty. Risk may be increased due to self-isolation and again, opportunities to speak with victims alone may be greatly reduced in this time. If talking on the phone, assume the abuser can hear. It could be a good idea to agree a safe word or method with your family so that they can tell you when it is safe and isn't safe to talk. 
on the following slides, we will discuss further details about safety planning and things you can agree with your families to try and keep them safe at this time. The impact of coronavirus on domestic abuse. Now we are in a state of lockdown in our country, which means that we have to self-isolate at home and people can only go out for essential things such as work or going to the shops. This means there is an increased risk of abuse for those people that are living in unsafe homes. I want to make the point here to remind people that for people fleeing domestic abuse that need to access support and help, the rules of isolation and lockdown do not apply and they can breach those rules to access help and get support or move into a refuge. Some of the increased risk of abuse is because there will be more time spent with an abuser. There is additional pressures at home such as children being at home, perhaps a loss of income, working from home and reduced access to food and supplies. The usual places of safety are closed such as school, work, shops, GPs or pubs. People will now have limited or no access to these places, limiting their opportunities to ask for help and or get support. It also limits opportunities for these places to check in with families, to discuss any issues and to recognise any concerns. There's also reduced access to support via the normal routes such as friends, families or employers. People may now not have the chance to have private conversations with trusted people. These lines of communication may be completely shut down, making them feel there is no way for them to access help. They may have reduced access to the phone or internet. Use of communication tools may be restricted by abusers and risk may be increased by the abuser having more access to people's phones and devices and being able to track more easily the contact they make with people or web addresses that they visit. There's an increased risk of economic abuse. For example, an abusive partner might interfere with a person's ability to work by insisting that they are responsible for childcare or they may prevent them from accessing the equipment they need to work from home. Also, child contact arrangements that are already in place may be breached at this time with abusers using COVID-19 as an excuse and not bringing children home because they're saying they have to self-isolate. There is guidance about this that has been published by Rights of Women and that the links at the end of this video, you'll be able to access that guidance. One of the ways as practitioners that we can support our families to stay safe whilst living with domestic abuse is to help them safety planning. Having a safety plan is basically having a plan in place to reduce the risk when living with an abuser or planning to leave. This is something we are going to be doing regular online training sessions about and you should have received an email about this. If you haven't, please contact me directly to access these training sessions. Having a plan for getting ready to leave. When a person is planning to do this, it's good for them to have a plan in place and to be aware of the increased risk at separation there is a heightened risk of homicide and harm when somebody is leaving and that's why it is very important for them to do it in a safe way, accessing specialist support where possible. Some of the things they need to consider are having a bag packed with essentials such as ID, important documents, money or medication and leaving that somewhere safe. They need to consider places to go and the options may be restricted to them due to people self-isolating. It could be useful for them to have contact details for local refugees or homelessness. They need to try and keep a mobile with them or at least have access to a phone, have a small amount of money and leave this somewhere safe if they can and think about when their opportunity might be to leave, particularly if they are self-isolating with an abuser. When doing a safety plan for staying at home, it needs to consider things like if the abuse is escalating. If it is, they need to try and keep near exits and out of rooms that may cause more harm, such as kitchens or garages. They also need to be aware of silent solutions. This means if you ring the police on 999 and you can't speak, if you press 55 from a mobile handset, this will alert the operator that you need the police. They could also agree a safe word or emoji, 
with friends, family or an employer and this could be used as an alert to tell them that the police are needed. There is also online support that they can access such as web chats, survivor forums and email support to enable them to connect with people whilst in isolation if they can't use the phone. There are personal safety apps such as Holly Guard or Bright Sky where they can log abuse and also try and remain safe. It's important for them to update services of the current situation. For example, if a perpetrator doesn't usually live with them but has moved in during the lockdown period, they must update services involved with them of this fact. If they are old enough and understand, they can also use children within their safety planning. Again, agreeing a, w a word with children that means they need to get the police if they can or signals to them to go into a different room to try and get safe themselves. Above all, they need to consider when their opportunities may be to ring somebody, to contact somebody or to leave and include this within their safety planning. As with everything else at the end of this video, there are links that include templates to safety planning and further detailed guidance and advice. When making contact with a family during COVID-19, obviously consider the risks that we've discussed in the previous slides. It's important to have as much history as you can about the person that you'll be talking to. If it's a new client, have as much information as possible about their case and the family. If it's somebody that you already know, consider previous history of abuse within this family. Start with open conversations, taking into consideration that the perpetrator may be listening or may be in the same room when you are calling and you don't want to put a person in further risk. So you can say things such as, we know that socially isolating is hard and likely to make someone's situations worse, so we're contacting everyone at the moment on a regular basis, just to check in on them, to make sure they're safe and what they need. So how are you doing at the moment? Conversations like this are generic and don't indicate that you are ringing them because you have concerns about domestic abuse. So if somebody is listening in, it hopefully wouldn't heighten any risk to that person. Try and ensure that it's safe to talk. Perhaps ask more open questions such as, are you self-isolating alone or with somebody else? Are they with you now? Is anyone else in the house? Are there any children living with you? These are just general questions that you could be asking somebody without prompting too much suspicion about the reason that you're calling if a perpetrator is listening. Talk about safety planning if it's safe to do so. If you can establish that they are on their own and that you can have an open conversation with the person, then you can start the conversation about safety planning and start agreeing code words possibly with yourself as a professional ringing them on a regular basis or perhaps code words that they can agree with friends, neighbours or family to indicate that there is an issue as discussed in our safety planning slide. On this slide, it shows some of the questions that we can ask our families when we're working with them and considering domestic abuse. It may be that we're asking them if they have a safety plan already, and if not, do they want some support in trying to fill one in? Do they know about silent solutions, which is when you ring 999 and if you can't speak, you press 55 to alert the police? Have they got a support worker and have they contacted them during COVID-19? Do they have a safe word that they've agreed with somebody to let them know that they need the police? Are there any other ways that they can signal for support? Are they accessing online support? Do they know how to cover their tracks online? If not, there's guidance at the end of this slide on the links provided to show them how to do this to make it safer for them if they are being tracked at home. Do they have a personal safety app such as Hollyguard or Bright Sky? And are they able to get out to get to the shop or do some exercise? And could this be a possibility for them to access further help or get the police if necessary? These are the type of conversations and questions we can be asking our families to make them think about how they can stay safe during this time. And overall, it's important to let our families know that services are still available in this time and the police will come out to help them and services will be there to support them. What to do if you're concerned or someone makes a disclosure to you? Consider safety and find a safe way to talk. Have the conversation in a safe and private place or way. In times of self-isolation, it may be difficult to get opportunities to speak with people about concerns. Always be aware of the risk. Don't do it in front of the abuser or over the phone if the abuser is likely to be present. Check if it is safe to speak. 
If you have concerns and can't see any safe opportunity to speak with the person, raise this with your line manager to discuss ways to make contact safely. Be non-judgmental. Don't make comments about the abuser or offer your opinion or personal experience. Just listen to them and believe what they're saying. Let the person speak and tell their story. Take it as credible. Reassure them it's not their fault. Continue to think about risk. Risk to the person, to yourself and to any children. Remembering that safeguarding is everybody's duty and to contact the eHash team if you have any concerns about children and in immediate risk ring 999 for the police. Offer support. If it's safe to do so, explain that there is support available and that you can help them access that support. Check what the person wants and feel safe with doing. Record. Record what has been said, what actions have been taken and what you intend to do. Make sure your record keeping is factual and up to date. And finally, act. Ensure that you do something. If you have concerns about domestic abuse or children at risk, or if somebody makes a disclosure to you or something just doesn't feel right, act on it. Speak to somebody. Report it. Don't ignore it. There are many local and national resources available for people affected by domestic abuse. These include the criminal justice system with police powers enabling them to, to remove perpetrators from the property for up to 28 days. There are also civil orders, these being non-molestation injunctions and occupation orders that instruct perpetrators to be staying away from the victim or be removed from the home. There are local services and on our final page we've got web links to our Rochdale domestic abuse web pages which will inform you of our local services. These include an IDVA service and refuge provision. There's also national helplines that people can ring including a 24 hour national domestic abuse helpline. There's online support such as web chats, emails, survivor forums where people can keep connected to specialist agencies in times where they may not be able to use the phone to ring people. There is also support for children such as specialist websites and helplines that children can ring if they're concerned. For support for perpetrators, for people that are worried about their own behaviour, we have a resource locally of a third sector organisation, RCT, that provides support over the phone at this time. And there's also a national helpline and web chat for people concerned about their own behaviour. Below this video, there are web links to our Rochdale domestic abuse web pages and also other national domestic abuse charities that have information on support planning, online support, support for perpetrators, resources for employers and practitioners. I hope this video has been of some use to you. If there are any amendments that need making to it, please email communitysafety at rochdale.gov.uk. Thank you for listening.